This lecture is part of a series of lectures on category theory and will be about Yoneda's lemma. So Yoneda's lemma is mostly about representable functors, so I'm going to start by just recalling a bit about representable functors. So suppose we've got a category C and an object A of C. Then we can define a functor from C to sets. And this functor is going to be called HA, and it's going to take B to the morphisms from B to A. So th this is just HA of B. And when I say a functor, it actually it's a contravariant functor, because if we've got a map from B1 to B2, then we get a map from morphisms of B2 to A to morphisms of B1 to A. And you notice that B1 and B2, their order has been switched here. So in other words, we're getting that from HA of B2 to HA of B1. So when you say a functor here, you should really think of it as being a contravariant functor, or you can think of it as being a functor from the opposite category to sets or whatever. Um, in, incidentally, the, the, the fact that the direction of the arrows gets switched is very confusing and you know, people are constantly getting their arrows the wrong way round in this. Anyway, we've got two questions. Given an object A, what is the functor H of A? And the second question is, given a functor um, F from C to sets, is F isomorphic to a functor of the form H of A for some A? in the category C. So if it is, we say the functor F is represented by this object A. So the question is whether whether functors are representable or not. And um, it seems best just to start by giving a few examples. So first of all, let's take C to be the category of topological spaces. And let's take A to be the real line. And we can ask, what is H A of an object B? Well, that's, this just means we're looking at all continuous maps from B to the real line. So it's just continuous functions. It's just the ring of continuous real valued functions on B, which is sometimes denoted by C of B, although this has nothing to do with the C I'm using for a category. A very similar example, we can take C to be the category of schemes or varieties, if you like, over some field or over a spectrum of some field. And we can take A to be the affine line. And then we can ask, what is the functor H of A? Um, well, H of A of uh, any scheme B is just the ring of regular functions on B. You notice these two examples are very similar. You've just replaced the real line with the affine line and you replace continuous real valued functions on something with the regular functions on something. And Grothendieck pointed out in algebraic geometry, it's, it's very often a good idea if you're given some sort of scheme to ask what is the functor it represents. Um, so affine line is not uh, terribly unexpected. A more interesting example is what happens if you take A to be the projective line then what is the functor H of P1? Um, well, H of P1 of B, which is morphisms of B to the projective line, can be described as follows. It's essentially isomorphism classes of line bundles over B plus uh, two sections that generate the line bundle at all points. Um, more generally, if you place one-dimensional projective space by n-dimensional projective space, you get something similar, except you have n plus one sections. So um, um, another example is a sort of historical example from algebraic topology. Um, so let's take C to be the nice topological spaces. And I don't really care exactly what nice means. It could be something like CW complexes, for example. And let's take A to be the Eilenberg um, MacLean space. So this is denoted by KG of N, 
where G is some sort of um, usually abelian group and N is some sort of integer. And this space has the property that um, most of its homotopy groups vanish except its nth homotopy group, which is equal to the group G. And then you can ask, what functor does this represent? Well, um, it doesn't really represent anything nice for topological spaces, but um, it does if you represent homo topological spaces optohomotopy. This means that instead of morphisms being continuous maps, they're homotopy classes of continuous maps. And the morphisms from B to A are usually denoted by putting B and A in square brackets. So the square brackets means homotopy classes of continuous maps. And this turns out to be the nth cohomology of B with coefficients in G. So in other words, the eilenberg maclean space represents elements of a cohomology group. Um, in fact, um, you, you can go much further with this. Brown proved that almost any reasonable functor from nice topological spaces to sets is representable in this sense. Um, here, reasonable means um, it must be continuous. Um, um, well, what does continuous mean? Well, continuous means it must take co-limits to limits. Um, so it doesn't quite take limits to limits because you remember there was, when you take took an, you, you had to look at functions from the opposite category of C to set, so everything kind of gets reversed and you, 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 the functor only takes co-limits to limits. So you can easily check that a representable functor has that property. And Brown showed the converse is almost true, that um, any reasonable representable functor with this, sorry, any reasonable functor with this property is in fact representable. And um, this is used quite a lot in algebraic topology. For example, you could take your functor to be some sort of generalized cohomology theory and then Brown's theorem shows that is represented by something and algebraic topologists spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what spaces represent various cohomology theories. <clears throat> well, um, we can also ask for the opposite question. Suppose we've got a functor f from c to sets, or rather from the opposite category of c to sets. We can ask, is it representable? So let's look at a few examples of this. So first of all, let's take the rather boring functor, which just takes f of b to be a one-point set. So we could just call this one. OK, it's not a terribly exciting functor. And we can ask, is it representable? Well, what we need is we need to have an element such that b, the morphisms from b to a, is the same as f of b, which is a, a one element set. Well, it's pretty obvious what that implies. This, this just means that a is a final object of the category. Um, a final object being one such that there's a unique morphism to it. For instance, in the category of sets, a would just be a one element set. And of course, sometimes a category has a final object and sometimes it doesn't. So sometimes this functor is representable and sometimes it isn't. Um, well, a final object is a special case of a limit. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of rather vacuous example of a limit. And all other limits can be thought of as representing objects in much the same way. Um, so I'll just do the example of a product of two objects, x times y. So in order to think of this as being a representing object, we look at the following functor. We just take b to the set of morphisms from b to x times the set of morphisms from b to y. So this is a functor from um, the, the, the category c to sets. And this is represented by the product if the product exists, because all we're doing is we're looking at the product x times y, and we're saying we've got an, an element of this set is going to be a morphism from b to x together with a morphism of b to y. And pretty much by definition of the product, there's a unique morphism from b to the product, making everything commute. And this just says that the product x times y represents this functor. And similarly, all other sorts of limits like pullbacks and 
um, equalizers and so on can also be thought of as elements representing a suitable functor. So another example, let's take C to be the category of sets and A uh, to be the, and, and, and for an object A we can consider the power set P of A and we can ask what does P of A represent? So what is the functor corresponding to this object? Well, we need to know what are the morphisms of sets from B to P of A. Well, P of A is just the morph can be identified with maps from A to a two element set. And this is the same as a map from A times B to the two element set, which is the same as a sub object or a subset of A times B, or at least it can be identified with this. And we can think of this as being a family of subobjects of A parameterized by B. In other words, for each element of B, you give a subobject of A. And it is this functor here that is represented by P of A. Uh, more precisely, the functor takes B to the set of families of subobjects of A parameterized by B. So that's that's how to think of the power set as, as being a representing element. Incidentally, you can do the same in any category. Um, well, let, let's take a category with finite limits just to make it easier. You can you can you can take the functor taking ele any element B to the family of subobjects of A and ask, is this represented by something? And if it is, you call that the, 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 the power set of the object A. Um, the existence of a power set is actually a very strong condition on a category. In, in, in fact, this is more or less the definition of an elementary topos. An elementary topos is just a, um, a category with finite limits such that all elements that the power set functor is representable in this sense. Um, well, instead of looking at subobjects of a set, we can put subobjects of, say, a scheme in algebraic geometry. And this leads us to the Hilbert scheme. So we can ask, um, can we find, um, can we sort of look at, classify the subschemes of say projective space. Um, so what we want to do is to find an object A such that F A is equal to families of um, sub things of projective space. So this is just like the previous example where we um, where we, we classified families of sub objects of some element. And in general, we can't do this. Um, Groth and Dick discover that first of all, um, we have to restrict to nice families and figuring out what the word nice means is kind of quite tricky. Groth and Dick discover that the key word here is flat. If you want to define a nice family, you need to put the word flat somewhere in the definition. And you also need to figure out what you mean by a sub thing of P to the N. So again, we want to say nice some things and the, the, the correct answer turns out to be a closed sub scheme. So in particular you notice that if we take a to be a point we want f of a point should correspond roughly to closed sub schemes of p to the n. And Groth and Dick managed to show that this f is actually representable. It's represented by the so-called Hilbert scheme. In other words, um, f of a is just the morphisms of a to the Hilbert scheme. Um, so the Hilbert scheme sort of classifies subobjects of p to the n in much the same way that the power set of a set classifies subsets of a set. Um, and you can take this quite a bit further. So um, 
we can look at things called moduli spaces or parameter spaces or classifying spaces. And these are all really the same thing. They're objects classifying a certain sort of function. They have different names for historical reasons. So moduli spaces tends to mean you're classifying isomorphism classes of something like elliptic curves. Parameter spaces often means you're classifying sub-objects of something like sub-schemes of projective space. And classifying spaces means you're probably an algebraic topologist trying to classify generalized cohomology groups or something. Um, so, for example, if, if we want to moduli space, we might want to classify, say, elliptic curves. So how do we do this? Well, we, would, we have a functor. We want a functor such that f of a point is going to be isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. And that doesn't, that doesn't really define the functor. That just says what the functor is on points. More generally, we want f of b to be nice families of elliptic curves over b. And you need to spend a fair amount of time saying exactly what you mean by elliptic curve over a scheme and what you mean by nice. As I said before, this involves the word flat at some point. And the problem is to find some object a so that f of b is just the morphisms from b to a. And if we could find such a thing b, then we would have a nice moduli scheme of elliptic curves whose points are just elliptic curves. And the, the problem is this does not exist. Um, so not all reasonable looking functors turn out to be representable. Um, in fact, the reason why this doesn't, why this functor doesn't exist is um, sort of a very basic problem. Um, I'll, I'll give a simpler example of it. Suppose we take C to be the category of sets and we let F B be the two point sets parameterized by B up to isomorphism. And we can ask, is F representable? Well, this is a kind of stupid question because f of b is um well the set of two point sets there's only one because any two point any two two point sets are isomorphic sets so f of b is just a point and it's represented by um this functor is represented by a, a single point it's just the final object as in our previous example um and the, the idea is if you've got any set here then there's a unique way to have a family of two point sets parameterized by it because there's a unique two point set associated with each of these points. So that example is kind of stupid. So let's vary it a bit. Let's take C to be nice topological spaces. I don't quite know what nice means, maybe Hausdorff or something. And we can ask, are the, are the families of two point sets representable? So what FB is going to be, is, is it going to be something like um, local homomorphisms to B, um, or maybe you know fi fiber bundles over B or whatever, um, whose, whose fibers are two point sets. And you might think this is pretty much like the same as with the category of sets. This is just going to be represented by a single point because there's only one two point topological space optoisomorphism, provided the space is, say, Hausdorff. Um, well, the problem is this fails and this functor isn't representable. And the, the reason is suppose you take B to be a circle. And the trouble is there's more than one nice way to have a, have a two point have a family of two point sets parameterize this. First of all, we could just have a, a trivial family of two point sets where over every point we, we, we just have a two point set. So if we put these all together, we get two circles. But there's another thing you can do. You can take a, a, a sort of twisted version of this where um, here again, over each point of the circle, there are just two points, but you get a sort of twist as you go round. So there's more than one family of two point sets over a circle. 
And we can't represent this by maps of a circle to a point because there's only one map from a circle to a point. Um, the problem here turns out to be that the two-point set has a non-trivial automorphism and kind of when you go around the circle you permute these and you get the same problem whenever you try writing down a moduli space of anything with automorphisms like elliptic curves have non-trivial automorphisms so you run into this problem for them and so on. Um, so there are quite a lot of, rep of functors that turn out to be not representable because of this problem with automorphisms. Um, there is actually a way to fix that, but that involves inventing stacks and fibred categories and things like that, which I won't go into this lecture. OK, now we'll finally get round to discussing what the Yoneda lemma says after um, rather a lot of background. So let's see what we've got so far. If we've got any category C, we've got a natural functor from C to the... Um, functors from the opposite category of C to sets. So these things are actually sometimes called pre-sheaves for complicated historical reasons. Um, so this is actually a functor. It's taking any object B to um, H of B, where H of B of X is just the morphisms from X to B. If I've got everything the right way around, it's very easy to get confused with this. And the question is, um, what is the relation between these two categories? So, so the elements of this category are functors, H, A, H, B, and so on. And if you've got a category of functors, that the, the morphisms of this category are just the natural transformations. So here we've got a, a functor um, between categories, and we want to know what is the relation between these two categories. In particular, suppose we pick two objects, A and B, and we've got the corresponding functors, H, A and H, B. Then we could look at morphisms from A to B in the category C, and we could also look at morphisms between these functors in the category of pre-sheaves. And Yoneda's lemma says, very simply, that these are the same. So, in other words, um, the category of functors um, really captures the category C in that you can reconstruct the morphisms between any two objects of C from it. Um, so, a way of saying this in categorical language is that this map of categories is full and faithful, where full and faithful means just that this map um, between uh, the sets of morphisms is, is an isomorphism. One of full means it's, uh, it's injective and the other means it's surjective and I can never remember which, which is which, but anyway. Um, so the proof of the Yoneda's lemma is actually more or less trivial um, and I think I'll just leave it as an exercise except that I will um, just say a little bit about the main point. Um, so, as with many theorems of category theory, the main problem with this proof is just trying to unravel the definitions. Um, so, what we've got to do is we've got to have a map from, given any morphism from A to B, we've got to find a morphism from HA to HB. And conversely, if we're given a morphism from HA to HB, we've got to find a morphism back from A and B. And this one is completely trivial to find. This one takes a few seconds of thought. Um, so I'll just sort of say how you do that. Um, so first of all, you need to remember what a natural transformation from HA to HB is. And in particular, this means that for any X in the category C, we have a map from HA of X to HB of X. And this has to satisfy various conditions that I don't really care about. In particular, let's take x equals a. Then we, we, we get a map from h a of a to h b of a. Well, this is just morphisms from a to a, and this is morphisms from a to b. And there's an obvious morphism from a to a, which is just the identity morphism. So we can take the image of the identity morphism in here and this will be the morphism from A to B that corresponds to the natural transformation from HA to HB. Um, so to summarise, Yoneda's lemma just says that the embedding of C 
in the category of pre-sheaves is really well behaved. Um, the nice thing about this is it means that essentially all reasonable functors from C to sets and now become representable in this category of pre-sheaves. I mean, you're sort of um, ensuring that just almost by cheating, by adding an element for every, for every functor.